Tonight we come to the heart of this little letter, 2 Peter, which was Peter's last letter shortly before he was executed in the persecution of Nero in Rome. He was in Rome. He was probably in prison at this time, and it's his last letter. And we come tonight, as we come into chapter 2, the heart of the letter. And really, as he knows his time is limited, this is probably going to be his last, last word out there to the body in general. It's a warning. He makes it a warning. He had said back in chapter 1, verse 14, knowing that shortly I must part I must put off this tent just as the Lord Jesus Christ showed me. And so it, he ended chapter 1 with that, encouraging them to a personal commitment to God's Word. Notice, notice how he ended chapter 1, beginning at verse 19. And so we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place. Until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your heart, knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation, for prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. And so Peter is, is telling the people, do not lose sight of this fact that this is God's word that you have been given. You know, therefore, because this is God's word. Therefore, he had said back there in, in verse 19, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place. Right up as he goes on to his glorious second coming. It's in the Psalms that tells us, you talk about a dark place, it's in the Psalms that tells us in Psalm 119, 105, your word, Lord, is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. The idea is there's darkness all around us. This gives us light for our feet and for the path. When he says, a lamp unto my feet, he's saying, this is what's going to prevent me from, you know, falling in a pit. And a light unto my path means it shows me the way to go in life. That's the value of the word. Now he's going to go on and say, it's very important that this is settled in your heart about the word of God. The, because, uh, and this is where the warning comes in. Going on with that in mind in chapter 2. But there were also false prophets among the people. In other words, the same time those holy men spoke from God, had received the word and were speaking it in the Old Testament, he says there were also at the same time false prophets mingling among the people. God continually in the Old Testament warned his people about the presence of false prophets and to beware. It's in the law that he says, you know, anybody comes along and, and, and claims to be a prophet, he better be 100% accurate. If he's not, if he's wrong in any way, we're not talking about a 90%, if he's wrong in any way, he is not from me. That is not a prophet of mine. You know what he even said? He even said if some guy comes along like a prophet and and, and, and what he says literally happens. And it can fall in the category of a sign and a wonder. That may not necessarily be from me. How do you like that? He said in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 13, 1 to 3, If there arises among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams, and he gives you a sign or a wonder, and the sign or the wonder comes to pass, of which he spoke to you, saying, Let us go after other gods, which you have not known. Let us serve them. You shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams, for the Lord your God is testing you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. And so you know what he's, he's saying there? What are you going to really follow after? You're going to follow after signs and wonders? You're going to be blown away and impressed by miracles? And you're going to make that the determining factor, whether this is the thing to follow or not, whether this is really the truth or not, whether this will really help me or not? 
by the fact that, wow, or are you going to follow the word of God? What's it going to be? You know, they were plagued with false prophets. Jeremiah in, in Judah declaring to Jerusalem, repent or the Babylonians are going to destroy this place, was absolutely surrounded with false prophets throughout his entire ministry. He says in, in Jeremiah chapter 14, just, these are just examples, verse 13 and 14, then I said, ah, oh, Lord God, behold, the prophets say to them, these are these other guys, you shall not see the sword, you shall not have a famine, but, but I will give you assured peace in this place. And it was, thus saith the Lord, everything's going to be fine. And the Lord said to me, the prophets prophesy lies in my name. I have not sent them, commanded them, or spoken to them. They prophesy to you false vision, divination, a worthless thing, and the deceit of their heart. You know, he, uh, he says in verse 25 and 26 of chapter 23, I have heard what the prophets, this is the Lord speaking, uh, have said who prophesy lies in my name, saying, I have dreamed, I have dreamed. How long will this be in, their, in the hearts of the prophets who prophesy lies? Indeed, they are prophets of deceit of their own heart. They're, just, they're, they're, they're prophesying out of their own imagination. And God says, this isn't from me. Oh, they're going, I had a dream. Oh, thus saith the Lord, but it's not from me. He says, in that same context, the Lord says to Jeremiah, verse 28 there, the prophet who has a dream, let him tell his dream. And he who has my word, let him speak my word faithfully. What is the chaff to the wheat, says the Lord. The one is chaff, the other is the real thing, the real fruit, the real wheat. Speak my word, Jeremiah. You see what Peter is saying? Even when those guys spoke the word of the Lord, were given it and spoke it out, which we have now on our laps, there were false prophets that were constantly contradicting him. You know, Ezekiel says the same thing. He was plagued with false prophets. He says in Ezekiel 13, 2 and 3, uh, God says, Son of man, prophesy against the prophets of Israel who prophesy and say to those who prophesy out of their own heart, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God, woe to you foolish prophets who follow your own spirit and have seen nothing. And then he goes on and pronounces judgment upon them. They're going to be judged for doing that very thing. But here's the thing. It was a major distraction to the word of the Lord. These things were, dis were a distraction from the truth. It was a ploy of the enemy to contradict the word of God with other words that purported to be the truth of God. How do you like that? You know, false prophets didn't go around with a big badge saying, I am a false prophet. You know? And... and and people were faced with that uh, constantly. It was a ploy of the enemy throughout the Old Testament that any time God brought a prophet of his on the scene, the enemy threw in false prophets. That's a scheme of the devil. Paul talks about the wiles of the devil or the schemes of the devil. This is one of them. One of them is to flood the market with false prophets. To to confuse people from the simple, dynamic, life-changing truth of his living word. This is the only living word out there from God that there is. And there is no other. And so he floods the market with counterfeits. And they abound. Now Peter is saying that has been the history of all of this. That, that has been the the, the style of the enemy right from the beginning. So he goes on, having made that clear, he goes on, and people were very aware of that. He's not saying anything they didn't know. Even as there will be false teachers, he says, among you, children of God, brethren. I'm going to be leaving now, and I don't want you to forget this. 
And it's a warning. There will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, false teachings that twist, warp, and, and, and change the Word of God in a destructive way, even denying the Lord who bought them and bring on themselves swift destruction. In other words, Peter is saying, you can plan on that happening. That will happen. You know, Jesus told his disciples in Matthew 7, 15, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. What an example. What a picture. You know what he's saying there? They look like sheep. They look like part of the flock. They seem like God's people, God's children, servants of the Lord. Paul said, Satan himself disguises himself as what? An angel of light. And so, and so it's, it, believe me, believe me, the, 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 the little suit, the little lamb suit that the wolf is wearing is very convincing and it looks very good. It looks, wow, look at that. But it, inwardly, it's a wolf. These false prophets and false teachers, they're a wolf. What does a wolf want to do to a sheep? It wants to destroy it. You know? So this is very destructive to the flock. Listen to what Paul says. He had the joy and the privilege of seeing an awesome work of the Lord begin in the city of Ephesus. And it was his last visit to Ephesus as he was heading back to Jerusalem, and from there he would be taken prisoner and, and off to Rome at the end of the book of Acts. But he, he gathered the elders together and he said, I've got something I want to share with you before I go. And just a little piece of that is in Acts 20, verse 20, 29 to 31. For I know, listen to what he says, I know this, I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And also from amongst yourselves men will rise up speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves therefore watch and remember that for three years i did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears he was so concerned about this he was so grieved by it with tears he warned the body of christ watch out for that watch out for this it'll be right amongst you it'll be all around you and in the Old Testament, the false prophets always outnumbered the true prophets. There was more of them. It's not a popularity contest. It's not take a vote to see what's right here. It's the Word of God in the midst of a world that has so many out-of-sync, off-the-wall, heretical voices out there. That's what Peter is warning the body of Christ. I'm not sitting here making a big deal out of this. God is. Amen. You know? And he, 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 he's, he's warning the brethren. Peter is, and, and all he's just saying, amen to, to this. And you can't go on the basis of signs and wonders. You can't say, well, look at that was a miracle. That proves they're telling the truth or that's the right way. You can't do that. God warned in the Old Testament, don't let that be your determining factor. I want to see if you really want love, the God of the Bible, or not. You know, if you're willing to follow my word rather than the latest fad. Jesus warned regarding the last days. And brothers and sisters, we are in the last days. We're on the brink of the book of Revelation, right on the brink. And Jesus warned of that era, Matthew 24, talking about those days, for false Christs and false prophets will rise and grab this, show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. I'm glad he said, if possible. You know, God's elect or God's elect. You know, you're, you're one of his. But the point is, it'll be so deceptive. 
even, I think, even the, the born-again believers will look at that and, and, and it, you know, it, it, it may cause a little, a little shaking. What's going on here? But it's deceptive. It's off the wall. And so, you know, uh, he, all these false prophets have something in common. They've all got something in common. Oh, they've got so many different little slants and, and hues and nuances. Take your choice. The enemy, would, the enemy would love you to pick one, pick one. Just not that one that's got the cross over it. Don't pick that one. But there's so many others out there. Pick one that fits you, you know. But they all have something in common. He said right there, he said in, in verse, verse 1, he said, even denying the Lord who bought them. You know, denying the Lord. Denying the Lord. There are two aspects to denying the Lord. One is, it's a denial of the deity of Jesus Christ. It's a denial that Jesus really is the Lord. That Jesus is God himself manifested in the flesh. That Jesus is Lord God. You know, his deity. He'll be less than that. All of these little false prophets and false teachers will, will, will have him. Oh, they'll have him up there, but, but not quite there. You know, uh, I, think, uh, I think to... Uh, um, Jehovah's Witnesses, you know, he's, he's the very first created being of God, you know. He's like a lesser God. I think the Mormons have him as, as an angel, brother of Lucifer, you know. They've got him on, on a lower pedestal there. Oh, he's big, he's important, but he's, he's lower. He's not the Lord. And so they, they, they deny the Lord who bought them. They, they deny who he is. And the second aspect of that is they'll always, in one way or another, deny the blood of Christ. They'll, de they'll deny the blood. In other words, the efficacy of the blood. The holiness and the righteousness and the justice of God was satisfied by the blood of Jesus Christ at Calvary. Satisfied. By his blood, we have been redeemed and received the forgiveness of sins and the gift of eternal life through his blood. They deny the efficacy of the blood. We have been cleansed. We have been saved by his shed blood at Calvary. You know? Thank you, Lord. And so, because of this, that assures whomever they are, whatever they're touting, it assures, as he puts it here, their swift destruction. In other words, apart from a literal, complete repentance on their part, they are utterly doomed. They are facing an eternal hell. And that destruction is sure. So he's, he says, Peter is saying, I'm going to be leaving soon. You need to know this. And you need to be warned, warned, my brethren, to follow the word of the Lord. Because this is what God has given to us. And beware of everything else that is out there. You know, God works signs and wonders. I'm surely not against signs and wonders. But they are not to prove the, the, the one who is, who is using it as the way of truth versus... God's word is the way of truth. God's signs and wonders 
will vindicate, substantiate, support, affirm, and confirm his word. You can go, wow, here it is right here, and God did it there. That's what Peter is saying when he says, I saw I saw Christ risen. I saw Christ transformed at the Mount of Transfiguration. And what I had the sure word of prophecy. I had God's word confirmed there. It confirmed his word. Hallelujah. So that's, that's, that's what those are about. And I'm sure that, that Peter, uh, like, like Paul, when Paul said, I- I'm warning you with tears about this. I'm sure there... Peter had that same heart when he goes on and says in verse 2, and, and many will follow their destructive ways because of whom the way of the truth will be blasphemed. You know, it amazes me how these people that promote these kind of things seem to have no trouble getting a crowd, getting this big, you know, mass following, you know, to follow after them. You got, well, what is that about? I'll tell you one thing it's about. Because they're really good at appealing to the flesh. Not the spirit, but the flesh. You know? As they malign the true way. I remember years ago down in Southern California seeing this guy on TV. He was called Reverend Ike. Anybody here remember see Reverend Ike? You remember Reverend Ike, man. Here's written, and I remember one time I was looking at this guy. If I remember correctly, he was on this stage, on this, he sat on a throne. And all these people, you know, were jammed into this auditorium. There had to be thousands of them. And he was up there just preaching away. But I remember one thing he said. You'll hear in your church, you know, you'll hear these pastors, you know. And, and they'll say, and they'll talk about the pie in the sky and the great by and by. But I'm here to tell you, I want my pie. I want it here and I want it now and I want ice cream on it. And everybody's breaking out. And, oh, yeah, yeah, woo, yeah. Preach it, Ike, you know. And, you know, one thing that these guys have in common is they will, they, they've always got to, 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 to malign and, and, and ridicule and put down uh, the body of Christ. You know, his living church. They've got to attack it, you know? And, and that's, you know, that's, that's what he's saying right here. They will have their, their own books. They'll have their own articles. Some cases, they'll even have their own Bible. And, and their attitude is, you know, uh, that this here is the real truth. This will give it to you straight. You have been misled. And, and this will straighten it all out for you. And this is what you need. And in, in so doing, uh, because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemed. You know, they're always steering you off onto something else. You know, and of course, that brings up a question. I mean, it's an honest question. What makes us think we have the truth? You know, uh, the attitude out there, I would say, of the world is, well, maybe they're right and you're wrong. You ever think of that? I mean, somebody's got to be wrong here. And what makes you think you're right and they're not? Everybody says the same thing. Everybody says they're right and the others are wrong. Oh, yeah? Well, just what if they're right and you're wrong? Well, I got one answer to that. It's not about me being right. It's about the Bible being right. And here's the point. You know, all these guys, they've got their little books and articles and everything to peddle, you know? We don't peddle. We don't have any books to peddle other, other than this one. This is it right here, the Bible. I've got nothing else to peddle than this. I'll tell you one thing. All those little corny little doctrines they have out there, nobody reading the Bible would come up with them. They have to read their literature to, you know, to understand even what they're trying to say you know they need the literature Jehovah's Witnesses had to print their own Bible because the the true word of God destroys their theology so you know they've got all that stuff going and I'll tell you one thing my heart is it's not about what I'm telling you it's about what this book is telling you 
And I have no problem at all. In fact, I'm very happy to hand somebody a Bible and go, you can't go wrong there. You just stick to that. And I feel real good about that. I've got a lot of peace about that. Just take that. And let leave, leave the other stuff off, you know. It, it's God's word. That's why Peter had just so strongly emphasized back in chapter 1. So we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place. Verse 20, knowing this first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. You don't need somebody's book or article to understand what it's saying. It's not of somebody's private interpretation. For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit of God. And so Paul can say, uh, Emphatically and absolutely in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, all scripture, and you know this verse, don't you, is given by inspiration of God, and that's what's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete. You don't need anything else. Complete and thoroughly equipped. For every good work. Thank you, Lord. This is what Peter is emphasizing at this point. But these other guys, which are out there in abundance, he goes on in verse 3 and says, By covetousness they will exploit you with deceptive words. In other words, it's that you know what the root of that is is covetousness. In other words, there's greed involved there. There's personal greed involved there. And you're going to be exploited by them. The word exploit there in the Greek is a commercial word. It, it's a word that was used for buying and selling and trading and everything on a commercial level. And he says, they're going to make commercial use of you. They're going to, they're going to use you for their own benefit and their own enhancement. For their own greed. And they're going to do it through deceptive words. It's going to happen. You know, years ago, I remember, uh, became very popular amongst certain groups, kind of the health and wealth crowd, a, group, uh, a, a theology called um, seed faith. Maybe some of you will remember that. But it, it sort of went like this in a nutshell. It said, um, using the parable of the sower, you know, that you scatter the seed, and if it falls on good soil you'll get a return, some, some 30, some 60, some 100 fold. And they say, now you, 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 you plant a, a, a seed of, of faith, and the way you plant that seed is, is through you know, money, giving your money to their ministry. And, and, and you know, if, you, if, if you give a dollar and then you, you believe God, because God wants to return it to you. And you that could return a hundredfold. One dollar in, you could get a hundred dollars back. Just think if you gave five bucks, we're talking five hundred dollars. You give a hundred bucks, you can look for ten thousand dollars to come back to you. It looked like the the foolproof stock market of the sky. You know, make your investment, God will bring it back to you. And you know. The fellow that came up with that corny, unscriptural theology got $100,000 for his, his little marketing trick there. And there were the pastors that got hold of that, believe me, many lined their pockets with the result of that. It is said the only people that that really worked for were the pastors themselves as people were throwing money at them because... You know, they wanted, they wanted the great return. But it didn't work because it's not scriptural. It's not what God has said. It was, it was, it, it was a perversion of God's truth. And so it literally, it's, um, they were exploited with deceptive words. They were literally exploited. And that's just one example of so much of that type of thing that's out there. 
you know, I've heard on the radio, I've watched TV shows where, it's, you know, this ministry is going to go under and, and people that God wants to save are going to die if you don't send us your money right now so they can get saved. Make you feel like, you know, it, God's broke, you know. And God's going to go, he's going to go down and not be able to do his good work if, if you don't send your money. Uh, oh, oh, that's terrible. What, a, what an attitude. And that's exactly Peter saying, this is going to happen. And the thing is, brethren, we, we, we see it happening th to this very day. A true shepherd of God's heart is to feed the flock, feed them, protect them, warn them. You know, Jesus told Peter, Peter, Feed my sheep. Do you love me? Feed my sheep. Okay. Shepherd my flock. Yes. These guys, these false prophets, their goal, believe me, is to fleece the flock. And so we got two different things going here. And so he goes on. Because of that, he says the last part of verse 3. For a little time, their judgment has not been idle. And their destruction does not slumber. In other words, Peter is saying, these guys are facing the imminent judgment of God. For, 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 for a little time. You know, God has always been gracious to give anyone time to repent. Time to turn back to him. You know, but the point he's making here, that time won't go on forever. The age of grace is not going to last forever. The one we're in right now. But the judgment of God is going to come. It is going to fall. And so, you know, sometimes I look at some of these people and these tele-evangelists and the like, and I see what they're doing. And, and I go, haven't they got any fear of God? How can they do that? It would absolutely scare me to death to do something like that. And they seem to be fearless about it. And so Peter goes on and he wants us to know, uh, you know, God will judge. That day will come. And so he, he, he's giving proof out of the Old Testament. It happened in the Old Testament. It will happen now. And so, going on, as an example, he says in verse 4, For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment. He's going to give a series of examples of where the judgment of God, of God has fallen and will fall. And he starts out with this class of angels. It's a very unique little group of angels. Because he talks about these guys being cast into this place that he calls into hell here. But the word there is only used here in the entire New Testament. It's Tartarus. It is not the final hell. It is not the lake of fire. It's not the ultimate hell. Because it says here specifically, first of all, it's Tartarus. That's the lake of fire. Secondly, they're... They're there in chains awaiting that judgment. That judgment hasn't come yet. So these are some angels that have been put in this place called Tartarus in chains awaiting judgment. Who are these guys? Because we know Satan himself isn't there. He's roaming to and fro on the earth. The Bible says that. Demons are fallen angels that were Satan's cohorts that are, that are going around and working havoc on church. These guys aren't. They're in this place called Tartarus. What is that place? Who are they? Well, there's a couple theories about that. You can't absolutely say for sure, but there's a couple, I think, pretty well-grounded theories. One is there is a place down there in association with Hades called in Revelation the Abuzo, the abyss, or the bottomless pit, we know that's a place of chains of angelic type beings. This very likely is another name for that place. But who are these angels that are down there locked up in there? 
You can compare Scripture to Scripture, and let me just say a possibility. There was apparently some angels at the very beginning of man's life on the earth before the flood who left their first place, their estate, the place God had designed for them, went down to earth and literally cohabited with human women. And the offspring of that were what the Hebrew calls the Nephilim. It's often translated giants, men of renown. What's interesting about that is you look at Greek mythology. And what do you have so much happening in Greek mythology? The gods, and the scripture tells us exactly what pagan gods are. They're demons. They're fallen angels. Cohabiting with human women and producing what? Guys like Hercules, you know? Men of great, of great renown in mythology. Powerful men. Makes me wonder if some of that Greek mythology doesn't have a basis in history, pre-flood, these, these fallen angels, these horrible characters cohabiting with women and producing Hercules-type people. any rate, whomever these guys are, God said, no more of that. Any. He does not allow them access to earth. They literally are in chains awaiting the final judgment and consignment to the lake of fire with Satan and all the lost. But there's something interesting about that place. There is one time when it is opened. The abuso is opened. The bottomless pit is opened. And it's in Revelation during the tribulation period when things have really gotten bad. And these angels of the abuse for a short season are let loose on the earth during the tribulation period. What they do at this time is horribly torment mankind for five months. Torment man so miserably that people are going to wish they could die, but they can't. Can you imagine? I can't imagine that. I just, just saying, maybe doing everything, everything they possibly could to kill themselves, and they can't die. But, but for a season, that's part of the, the horror of that tribulation period. Some angels are going to get loose. Could be these very guys. All this is speculation. The things I've described to you will happen. And there are angels that are, that are so bad and so evil, God doesn't let them on the surface of the earth, that, that they're kept in that place for that final judgment, ultimately and finally. But the point, you know, the, the point that Peter is making here, if God is so committed to judging these angels... Will be he will be rebellious angels. Will be will he be any less committed in judging rebellious mankind? And the answer is no. No, he wouldn't. He goes on in 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 verse uh, verse five. And did not and did not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah, one of the one of eight people. A preacher of righteousness bringing in the flood on the world of the ungodly. There's another example. You know what's interesting about that? Do you realize how long it took Moses to build that ark? It, approximately 100 years. Moses was, uh, excuse me, Moses. I do that to my kids. You know what? I always give my kid, my grandkids this riddle. How many animals, how many of each kind of animal did Moses put in the ark? And they're going, two, no. No, not, yes, it was. No, no. Well, what do you mean? Moses didn't put any uh, animals in the ark. Noah did. Okay. I get them every time. Yeah. So I did it myself. Noah. 
was spared, but it took him around 100 years to build that ark. What's going on for 100 years? Noah is preaching righteousness to those people. Noah is warning them and sharing the way of God with them. And they're not responding. They're absolutely set in their rebellion and their unbelief. I heard one person put it this way. The gospel of Jesus Christ is so true and it's so powerful that anybody to go to hell literally has to step over Jesus Christ to get there. You know? Because he's right in the way. Well, God's patience again. But the point was, the day came when God shut the door of the ark. And it was shut. And then it was too late. And so, you know... As he, as he says here, their judgment had not been idle and their destruction did not slumber. And then also, he says in verse 6, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them to destruction, making them an example of those who afterward would live ungodly. Of course, you know, Sodom and Gomorrah. We get our word sodomy from that event in history. I mean, it's, it, it's sexual perversion, but the emphasis is on homosexuality. And God's made very clear there what, what a perversion and, and what a sin that is. But he does it as a warning, and he does it as a call to save, to heal, to, to rescue you know, uh, the reason he says these things isn't to condemn, it's to throw the lifeline. But I find it interesting. You know, a, a little mute, a, a little mute evidence of the, of, of the truth of this whole thing is we know that Sodom and Gomorrah, by, by the description of the Bible, was right where the Dead Sea is now. Uh, if there's any ruins left of those places, which there may not be so utterly destroyed, it would be somewhere under the Dead Sea. You know the thing about the Dead Sea? Number one, it's the lowest place on the entire planet. And number two, it's the deadest place on the entire planet. You think God is saying something there? And he says he gave this as an example for the ungodly. Is our society listening? Are they noting are they taking note? No, not at all. Quite the opposite. Flaunting the sin that destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. Flaunting it in rebellion against God. And demanding uh, you know, everyone to just embrace and accept the sin. I'm all for embracing and accepting the sinner, but not the sin. I want to see him rescued. I want to love them to Jesus, you know? But they're not paying attention, are they? He says right here, this is an example for them. And they're not listening. They're not paying attention. And you know what, what Jesus said? As the days of Lot were, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. And one of the signs that of the times that we're right near the end will be, things will be sort of as the days of Lot were. You know, in other words, sexual perversion, emphasis, destruction of the home and marriage and, and, and a pure relationship between a man and a woman and homosexuality will be rampant in the world, rampant in our community. So, I, you know, I want you to know, in one sense, I can look around and see what's going on now, and, and it grieves me, but on the other sense, I go, Lord, you're coming soon. This is a clear indication. You're coming soon. Hallelujah. And then he adds this, and I'm going to wrap it up tonight with this. Uh, he, he says there in, in, uh, in verse 6, uh, we, I read that. Verse 7, and um, delivered righteous Lot, who 
who was oppressed by the filthy conduct of the wicked. For that righteous man dwelling among them tormented his righteous soul from day to day by seeing and hearing their lawless deeds. And so I think, I think in a sense we can kind of understand what Lot was going through. You know, as he saw his world the way it was, going the way it was, doing the things it was, it's just how it tormented him, how it vexed his heart and his soul. I think there's, there's brethren that God has planted in certain places, maybe in certain businesses or jobs, work environments, even homes or something like that, that, that are absolutely this type of thing, sin, and not just, not just this type of thing, but all f- forms of wickedness and sin and wrongdoing, everything is just kind of in their face all the time, and it just grieves them. Oh, I hate this. Oh, Lord, get me out of here. I don't want to be around this. And, and there it is. And it just torments the soul. That's what he says about life. We can relate to that. A lot of times it causes us to look up and say, come, Lord Jesus. Yeah. You know? <laughs> you know, I'll tell you what I like about this. He calls Lot a righteous man. He says, righteous Lot righteous man his righteous soul you go back in the old testament you look at lot i don't know about you but i'm not too impressed with the guy you know he seems to be kind of nominal at best and yet god looks at him and says my righteous lot don't you love that you know um romans Chapter 8, verse 29 and 30, the Lord tells us, For whom he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. Whom he justified, these he also glorified. Notice it's all in the past tense. Don't you love that? And so we're sitting here, and what do we see? We see a bungling baby stumbling, bungling baby. God looks and sees a glorified saint of his, washed in the blood, cleansed by Jesus, in whom the righteousness of Christ not only dwells, but, but it's clothed in the righteousness of Christ. Wow. Wow. That's why God could look at some of those guys in the Old Testament. I'm going to share about this at the Calvary Chapel uh, Auburn's Men Retreat this weekend because I'm going to speak there. But God looked at some of these guys like Gideon, you know, that was hiding, at, you know, at, at, at the wine press, threshing his wheat at the wine press to hide it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord, which is probably Jesus, comes up and says, Hail, O mighty man of valor. <laughs> Who are you talking about? I see your potential with Jesus in your heart and your faith in him. Almighty man of valor. And that was Lot. You know, the cool thing about that is when we get to glory, and when this was written, Lot was in glory. Lot was with the Lord. Hallelujah. Gives me hope. He's called righteous. In his little sojourn on earth, there's not much righteousness there, but he's called righteous when he's in glory. And it reminds me what the Lord says in Isaiah 43, 25. The Lord speaking, I even I and he am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake, and I, I will not remember your sins. Oh Lord, here I am and I've just got to, Lord, would you please? I mean, I just, what are you talking about? I don't remember anything like that. Because it's been washed in the blood of Jesus. All we will be at that point, all we will be is the righteousness of Jesus Christ himself. 
That's why Paul said, you know, for me to live is Christ, but to die, oh, oh, that's gain. I can't wait. I can't wait. And it's coming soon. But the point is, there will be those and these others who would mislead you, attempt to rob you of that precious truth and faith in Jesus of whom the judgment of God will fall. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for the fact that you have encouraged us, you have called us, you have, Lord, commanded us to base our whole being and life daily and future upon the truth of your word. Lord, which is the verbal foundation of your love, clearly spoken to us. So, Father, we, we thank you for that. And, Lord, we just pray that none of us will allow the, the way of the world, the words of those off-the-wall voices to influence us, that we might be humble children just of your living word, the way of life, the truth, a relationship with Jesus Christ himself. Thank you, Lord. And all of God's children said, Amen. 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 Amen.